Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve distinct subsequences. This is a, another hard problem and this is actually going to be solved with dynamic programming. It's very similar to some other dynamic programming problems involving subsequences, particularly longest common subsequence, which is a problem that I've solved on this channel before. So if you struggle with this problem, I would recommend solving this one or watching that video before. So we're given two strings, S and T, and we want to return the total number of distinct subsequences of S, which equal T. So basically what we're doing is we're looking for subsequences of S that happen to match the entire string T. And if you don't remember what a subsequence is, basically for, let's say, this string, a subsequence is just a subset of some particular characters. So basically, maybe we don't want to include the B, we don't want to include the D. So this happens to be a subsequence ACE, right? A, C, E. This one is not a subsequence because it's not in the correct order of these. You can't change the relative order of characters in a subsequence. So we're given an example S and T. So basically these are both rabbit, just spelled a little bit differently, right? This one has an extra B in it. So how many different subsequences of this string S can we take that exactly match this string T? Well, let's look character by character. So let's start at the first character of this, the first character of this. They exactly match each other, right? So, okay, that's good. So now we're going to look at the sub problem, right? We found these two match exactly. Now, how many different ways can these subsequences match each other? Now, how many ways can we get this string? How many subsequences of it can we get that match now the remainder of this string? Now we see, again, both of these characters are A. So, so far they're exactly matching each other. That's good. And we get to a B. These Bs match each other. That's also good. So, so far we're getting pretty close to getting a subsequence of this to exactly match this, right? We only have to match three more characters. We see another B. That's good. But now we see we're looking for an I, right? We need an I and a T so that we can create an exact subsequence of this. But so far we have a B, right? So what are we going to do in this case? So far what we've been doing is we've been basically evaluating this. We've seen that at the I pointer, which is corresponding to the string S, and the J pointer is corresponding to string T, if the characters at those corresponding positions match each other, we're basically just incrementing both indices, right? Because we're just trying to match that string T, right? So if both of the characters match, we can continue to move on, right? So this is going to be the else condition where we just got to right now, right? We're looking at B in the string S and I in the string T, right? They don't don't match each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to take i and increment it by one. We're going to take the i pointer and then shift it to this next character over here, right? Why are we leaving j the same though? Basically our j pointer is over here and it's going to stay at this character. Why is it staying here? Because it's required for us to match every single character in string t, right? That's what the goal of this problem is. We need all subsequences from s that exactly match t. So what we're doing is so for now we're just saying this b we're skipping it, right? Now we're going to look at the next character. Maybe there's some ways that we can match the remainder of this string to this string. Okay, so now our I pointer is at this character I, our J pointer is at this character I. So in this case, the characters do match each other. So what are we going to do? Similarly to what we did before, we're going to increment both indices by one. We can move to the next position. So we're at this character now in S, we're at this character now in T. Once again, these characters exactly match each other. Right, so once again, we're going to take both pointers and shift them by one. Now we get to a base case, right? Both strings are empty. So what are we going to return in that case? Basically, that tells us we went through every single character in T, right? And we matched every single character. Now there's no characters remaining, right? So what would the count be in that case? How many subsequences of an empty string can we match to another empty string? Basically just one, right? That's our base case. We're returning one now. But my question to you is, hold on a minute. We're returning one, right? So our result happens to be one. But in this problem description, they return to three. Why is that? How did they get three different ways when our current algorithm that I've shown you these two conditions only gave us a single one? So what did we end up missing? Well, let's take a look at their explanation over here. They say there's three different ways. Why is that? Well, when you take a look at the B characters, right? What we said 
What we originally said is this B is going to match this B for sure. And that's the only way that we did it. But we, and then basically we took like over here, you can see we took our pointers and incremented them both by one. Then we went to the next B, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Isn't it possible just because these characters match doesn't mean we have to require them to match. We can say, Hey, let's just skip this B, even though it matches this B, maybe there's another B over here that can also also match this B. So what I'm saying here is if these characters match each other, right, if the if, with this if condition, we this is one way we can do it, but we can also do another thing, which is we can take our I pointer, increment it by one, and take our J pointer and leave it the same. Basically, we're doing over here what we did down here. So in, in, in this if case, we're going to take both of these results, basically counting the number of ways th that we could compute subsequences with both of these and totaling them up. And that's what we're going to end up returning. So what would happen if we ended up skipping this B and then let's say we took this B and matched it with this previous B, right? Then what would we get? Well, then we'd get to these pointers, right? And again, we can say, okay, these Bs are now going to match each other, right? And then these two I characters are going to match each other. And then the Ts are going to match each other. So that's an additional one way that we could, we could take a subsequence of S and turn it into T. So that's another way. So far, our total is two. So what's the third way that we could do it? Well, once again, Again, we see that this B matches this B, but it doesn't have to be that way. In another way, we could say, okay, these Bs match each other. We're going to now skip the second B and we're going to say, okay, these two Bs are going to match each other. So that is what the third way would be. And then, of course, we'd have our I's match and we'd have our T's match. So this covers exactly what we're going to do if the characters match each other. And this is what we're going to do if the characters don't match each other. We're going to do this recursively with depth first search or backtracking, whatever you want to call it. And we we notice that we're probably going to be doing a lot of repeated work, meaning our when we're, when we're calling that function, we might be passing in the same I value and same J value into that function. So we're going to use a cache so that we don't repeat the same work twice. And so how big is that cache going to be? Well, how many possible ways could we call our depth first search function? We could call an I value for basically the length of our string S and we could call a J value for the length of our string T. So basically the number of times we could call it is going to be the length of both strings multiplied by each other. Let's just say that's big O of N times M. So that's going to be the memory as well as the runtime of this algorithm because we're going to be caching it. I've solved a lot of DP problems with the bottom up approach. So this time I am going to be using the recursive approach, which is top down. But there's one last thing I want to cover before we jump into the code. Let's look at two more base cases. So let's say our string S had a single value A and let's say our string T was empty, right? So it's an empty string. How many subsequences of our string S can we take that convert exactly to T? Well, only a single one, right? So basically, if we just take this entire string and just don't take any characters from it, that counts as a subsequence. So this is going to return one. So basically, if our string T is empty, because we remember the previous case where let's say string T and string S. S were empty, right? If they're both empty strings, then in that case, we're also ending up returning one. So basically the condition is if our string T is empty, we return one as the base case. What about the opposite case where our string T is non-empty? We have an A here, but maybe our string S is empty. Now, once again, the question is how many subsequences of this string S can we take that exactly match the string T? We're looking to exactly match the string T. Well, since this is empty, there's no characters in it. We can't possibly get an A from this. So we can't possibly match this A character. So therefore, in this base case, we're going to end up returning zero. There's no subsequences of the string S that match string T. So that's all that we need to cover. We have our base cases handled and we have this logic that we are going to be using. So now let's get into the code. So as I mentioned, we are going to be using a cache. You could use a two dimensional array for this, but I prefer using a hash map or dictionary in Python because it just is a little bit easier for me. So we're going to be passing two parameters, I and J, which tell us the corresponding positions of string S and string T that we're currently at. We know that one base case is if J has reached the end of the string, that means string T is empty. That means we can return one as the base case as we previously discussed. The other base case is if we reach the end of string S, 
and that means we can't possibly match the string t anymore, so we're going to return zero in that case. Last base case is if this ij pair has already been computed in our cache. If that's the case, then we can return the value that is stored in our cache. So then we remember there's two cases for the logic that we have to cover. So if s of i matches exactly t of j, then we know we're going to be running depth first search. We're going to be doing it two different ways. We're going to be looking at the remainder of string s and the remainder of string t. And we're going to also be calling depth first search with the remainder of string s, but the entirety of string t. So we're going to be incrementing i, but not incrementing j in this case. And we're going to call both of these and total up the result. And then once that has been totaled, we can return it. But before we return it, we want to make sure that we cache it. So let's put it in the cache at position ij. The else condition is basically the same thing as this, except I'm going to copy paste it. So except this portion, right, since these characters don't match, we have to only shift our I pointer. We still have to look for a character that matches the character at position J. And once either of these has been computed, then we can return whatever value we ended up storing in our cache. And this is the entirety of the depth for search function. Pretty short because we didn't have to pass in a lot of variables into it because I defined this function inside of another function that just makes things easier for me. So now all we have to do is call it. So let's call depth for search starting at zero zero for both of the beginning of the strings. And then we return the result. So this is gonna be big O n times m, basically multiplying the length of the strings together, time and memory complexity. I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.